Welcome in, guys. We are going to Garden Report. It's Friday, heading into a holiday-ish weekend, so to sort of. Is it? Not quite. It's but extended. It, feel, it feels like... Um, it feels like you're not going to see me for a little while. That's, <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. Um, but um, it feels like, you know, free agency is about to begin less than half hour away now at 6 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and, uh, you know, Bobby, it, we were saying how quiet we expected it to be. Uh, and then you just saw a tweet. Who was that from? Um, Grange up in uh, Toronto, right? Yeah. Michael Grange. Um, that said – you know, could be as many as 15 deals already done. Look for chaos to ensue at 601. We will do our best to keep up with everything as it comes through. Uh, but what we have now is, you know, kind of some big stories. Um, it feels you know, like how- a lot of guys, the biggest names are probably headed back to their teams, it seems like. So I'd expect Middleton, Irving, Russell, Draymond, Van Fleet, Grant. Those yeah. type of names just shooting back to their teams for the most part. And yep. again, it's going to be interesting what happens here with the amount of money out there from some of these lottery teams. You're going to pretty quickly see Grant prop up into the top five to ten names available for those teams. Uh, so is he the kind of guy that those teams want to spend on? Uh, the list is growing narrower, uh, but also the uh, possibilities for those teams continues to narrow. So as we sit here, 5.30, I'm still leaning on Grant playing elsewhere next year. But I wouldn't be stunned if the Celtics came to an agreement with him on yeah. mid-level money either. I, I, I really am curious. It's always been my contention that um, this these suitors, you know, it's been discussed depending on, you know, where. But it, so much is speculative. You know, early in the year, you know, it was talk of, You know, it's going to cost 18 to 20. Uh, And, you know, Celtics should have offered 15, 16 to wrap it up. And now they're going to be paying for it. And, you know, maybe it seemed like that for a little bit. And then as time went on, it seemed less likely uh, because Grant, you know, started to have his minute, his role reduced. um, And, you know, things kind of got weird there. And then with the new CBA, you know, teams, you know, how they are, you know, how they are going to spend their money is obviously uh, going to be a little bit different now. So we're still trying to feel out exactly what that means. But I never, some people have reported, there'll be teams lining up to sign Grant Williams. I, I've never believed that, even at the beginning of the year. I believe it less now. But as you say, Bobby, you know, uh, you know as we were talking about it, it really only takes one uh, to sign an offer sheet. You know, some team that's got to fill out, you know, that wants the salary, wants to do something with it you know, sees the value, recognizes the opportunity. Um, You know, the guy like Grant, though, I've always thought is like a good player on a contender. But like contenders really only have mid-level money to throw around, if that. Many of them only have taxpayer mid-level. There's just not a lot of teams that like can or will spend 18, 16, 17, 18 million on a guy like Grant, but some team might throw something at him and make it make it interesting for what the Celtics need to do. Uh, and so if that number comes in 14, 15, 16, he's gone. Yeah. And there's some t- sign and oh. trade possibilities with other teams that you probably see Sacramento come off the board. I think that became a name for a minute uh, before they extended Harrison Barnes. They probably don't have enough room under a hard cap. Now Memphis, Probably not. You know, they they might need a guy like Grant, but I just don't think there's enough room for them under the hard cap. Knicks don't make sense to me. Hawks don't make sense to me. Raptors don't either just because of the position overlap. So we're talking about the Jazz. I know they've been reported. The Magic, I think, have some weird quirks going on that they're going to have to figure out, but you could take money back from them. Uh, they they have a log, guard log jam too, which interests me a little bit, but they also have a lot of forwards. I don't see them... Pistons have a ton of front court guys, beef stew and the rest. I don't see them. So we're talking Spurs, Pacers, who've made a ton of sense to me for a while, but they've yeah, been hot. You've always kind of pointed teams. at the Pacers as a, as, the a, as your main possibility, the Pacers. Yeah. So the Rockets to me are probably the favorite right now over the, uh, 
Pacers who drafted a power forward in Jarris Walker, who uh, I guess are hard on hard on Max Strews. They were in on Harrison Barnes. That's not a possibility anymore, really. They've had their Kyle Kuzma interest too for a little while, it seems. So they have some names that are floating around. Yeah. Maybe they circle back to Grant, but right now where you're looking at Houston not landing James Harden, it seems, and we'll get to that in a second here, I'm sure, but they have so much money. They have so many guys that they could send back to Boston uh, on shorter money than Grant will potentially make here. And they can overpay for Grant a little bit since they have that cap space available. And, right. you know, right, he right. makes a guy who knows and likes Grant. So that, to me, if I had to make a prediction right now, is probably where he ends up. Uh, and I think he could probably be in play to even – You've moved on to there. Houston now? Yep. Yeah, I mean, he can play big minutes there for sure. They need defense bad, yep. especially as they try yep. to implement that identity there under Ime. And he just knows and trusts this guy, even though he hated him at different points, uh, you know, sarcastically or not. But I don't know. It makes a lot of sense to me. There's always the state tax thing there, too. You're going to make more per dollar in Houston than you are in Boston or at some of these other places. So I think – that's how it's going to go. And you can get it. I've always thought you can get a TP back if you toss in a first or a second. You saw that happen today with the Nets who traded Joe Harris to uh, Indiana. No, Detroit, just in the cap space, just to get a 19 million TP. I think they sent a couple seconds. So if you send, I, it's not very exciting to people, but if you send Grant to a team with cap space and get back his salary in a TP, you can use that all year to take back any kind of salary. And that's more valuable. Let's say Grant signs for $15 million with Houston. You get $15 million back on a TP. That's more valuable to carry throughout the year to me than using your mid-level for $5 million on who knows who. And we can kick around some of those names in a little. But you're probably not getting much for $5 million, are you? No. Nope. Cam nope. Reddish. I know that name still excites some people. Uh this free agency class isn't great. You start digging into some of the deeper names. It's not Maybe great. get lucky with a Niang. Maybe get lucky with a Javante Green. Or I still think the biggest steal of this free agency is probably going to be Seth Curry, who I think makes some sense on the Celtics roster, though probably more in other places. Well, uh, what's so. the timing of things, Bobby? When can offer can offer sheets roll in at six oh one here? Yes. So the way the offer sheets working, this I know year, that you have the then the clock starts. Yeah. Once, once it's, once it's accepted, but like, could we hear about one this early? I, I, I feel like you usually don't get them right at six Oh one, like the offer sheet sort of offer, but I don't know, maybe some team wants to be aggressive and just go right out there. And maybe that's out there. Um, I think I, it's, it's just the been... opposite though. Guys like him get frozen a little bit, especially as cap space dries up guys, that's the problem. their own guys. And then all of a sudden there's not much left. The new CBA, obviously, like, look, it's always been a squeeze for the middle class, you know, uh, you know, with with big money deals going out, 50, 55 million dollars, a third of the cap going out to single players, you know, and then, you know, you're going to pay your rookies and you're going to pay the, you know, the your mid levels and your this and that the, the middle class does get squeezed. Um, but I think even more so now with that new CBA and again, uh, you know, Jake Fisher, who I know you, uh, you know, kind of reference a bunch uh, for Yahoo. Uh, one of his little nuggets was uh, just, I think, in his estimation, he sees Grant as a potential um, as as a, as a guy who might have to wait out the mid level market and see who what's left. Um, and so that might it might come later for him if that were the case, rather than a team jumping out here and being aggressive and like targeting him and making him the guy. So I am curious exactly. Um, exactly what goes down there. Uh, another thing Fisher threw out there, and I want to throw it out. This is not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, this is not necessarily uh, free agency related, but it's uh, it's uh, trades that the uh, that the Clippers tried to re-engage the Celtics on 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 uh, Malcolm Brogdon. And what my question is is whether or not. And sorry, I was looking for a graphic here. Um, I don't know how the James Harden thing, which we haven't fully discussed, uh, factors into that into that thinking because this was they did so days ago, um, and uh, I don't know if they're still interested in it. But the fact that they brought it back up tells me two things. I don't think the injury was ever the real reason that it got derailed. Um, maybe they tried to squeeze a little bit more out of the Celtics because of that, and I think that 
Celtics just couldn't wait around. But two, I think that I think that's still possibly in play that the Celtics could also move move another guard. Could he could also move Brogdon? Could still move Brogdon. I don't I don't think it's a certainty he's here. Yeah, they've talked about him quite a bit as part of the picture, though. Particularly Stevens in the two pressers recently, he's made a pretty concerted statement in both that. Brogdon's part of this team going forward, and I think he should be, depending on the health here. Seems like the latest reporting we have on is he's just going to rest for four to eight weeks and try to come back from it without the surgery. Regardless, I think you have enough depth at guard to sustain whatever time he needs to miss here. Then I think you're going to need him into the season. Uh, This is a guy I haven't understood all along, the desire to move off, and money dump in particular doesn't make a ton of sense to me. He was... Even me as one of the more critical guys uh, against his play during last year, thought he made a positive impact here. And particularly that white broadening combination last year made a phenomenal strides at the end of last year. Uh, they were great together. I want to see those guys together again. Uh, so are you propping up Pritchard if you're moving on from Brogdon? Are you bringing something back from LA that entices you at all? This whole Harden thing, continues to confuse me because I just don't think the Clippers have anything to offer here. We know they're short on. No, it's funny. I thought you could have potentially re-engaged Washington on this and brought Tyus, you know, brought Tyus Jones over if you wanted to do this deal, get him to the Clippers, but the Clippers are just out of juice in you know, like, I mean, and then they send a pick to Washington or something like that, or one pick to, I, I don't know how that one works out. Yeah, unless you love Norman Powell, who's a little cheaper than Brogdon, less of a point guard and creator overall. It, it's it's hard to see how this comes together, especially from a Celtics angle, if they're getting involved with this whole thing here. It's going to be super interesting to see how it plays out because I think the Celtics are going to keep Brogdon. I don't, is this just a hedge by the Clippers in case this Harden thing doesn't work out? Then they're circling back to Brogdon. Were they just holding out on Brogdon because they could land hard in here. And if that doesn't work out, this is their backup plan. I don't see how this all comes together in tandem. I I just don't money wise and asset wise. The Clippers don't have picks. Their players don't have a ton of value. I I know they waived Eric Gordon yesterday. He's another salary off the table for them to play with. Powell's the only guy you look at with any discernible value. So maybe the Celtics like him at 18 over three years versus Brogdon at 22 for two especially if he's going to be healthy here. Um, I wouldn't hate that because I do think that shooting guard position, that off-ball shooter, is something of a position of need here. And Brogdon did a pretty good job filling it this year. Maybe there's a desire by Brogdon, and and I think this is understandable given what he said during the year about sacrifice and all that, for him to go back to a situation where he's starting, back to a situation where he's a frontline guy. So maybe – there's some Brogdon involvement in this too, in terms of what he wants out of his future after, you know, the year where he sacrificed and played that six man role. Uh, but from a Celtics perspective, from a value perspective, I don't see the upside in trading Brogdon unless you're just trying to save money here. And you were there yesterday, John, Brad was adamant. They have the green light to spend. They have the green light to go into the second apron. And I think they should. Yeah. I mean, I'm curious. I mean, Here's the thing. It's one thing to say that. It's questionable whether they mean it. And not in a bad way. I'm not saying it's a lie. But, like, it's... Yes, we are not saying you cannot under any circumstances do it. But it better be... You can't just spend, like, you know, drunken sailors. You know, like, you just can't... You just... It's got to be... Like, Wick might have a little say in whether or not such and such is worth it. If Brad's like, I really want to do grant and I think it's going to take 18 million per, you know, Wick might be like, yeah, don't, don't do that. Yeah. Uh, So like, again, there's a difference between being told what you can't do something and having like a full, full, full blown uh, green light. But, you know, it's, it's different than what it was, right? I mean, before it was very clear that, like, you know, we, I mean, they did backflips trying to get under that stuff. They hurt themselves trying to get under there. You know, they they traded away assets 
just simply for nothing, just to, just to shed money. You know, the Desmond Bain is the one that's going to bite people in the ass the hardest. You, you, you just gave that pick away to get off of Venice friggin' canter, you know? Um, so the money's clearly been an issue in the past, but they're in a position now where I think it's an in for a penny, in for a pound sort of thing. I can't stay under. So at this point, F it, you know? And again, you have to leave it to a GM. What does the second apron matter now? The second apron matters less to the owner who's still paying the same tax. It matters to the GM who has going to have a harder time doing their job. So you weigh it that this signing, while it's going to hurt us and put us into that second apron and, and handcuff us for a year, is going to be better than anything we can do with the flexibility of not being under that second apron. There's going to be scenarios like that, Bobby, you're, where they're going to try desperately to avoid it is to be that – you know, that repeat offender second time in three years or whatever, freezing draft picks down the road, stuff like that gets a little bit tougher. But can you live one year without being able to make any trades, having to match things perfectly, basically only being able to do one for ones? You can for the right guy. So I think there, I think you can, I think he can spend for the right guy. Yeah. My point though is don't, dump money just to avoid it. I think it's the opposite here. And I think that's part of why they did this Porzingis thing is they want to go over it. They might want to go over it in a substantial way. So if there is a guy you can bring back later with uh, Grant and other salaries, the tricky thing is one of those restrictions is you can't combine salaries and trades. Uh, so you do have to time everything the right way here. And that is why I like the TP is you're not restricted while you have the TP because you're below that line. You're not spending up to that line yet. Right. Uh, and you could just sign a mid-level guy and fill out the roster with Blake or whatever and stay under that line by however, 100,000. Um, but I just don't think – I've been saying all along, John, I don't think there's a great benefit to avoiding this uh, second apron. I, I think you embrace it. I think you deal with the consequences. That's how Brad seemed to be talking yesterday from his perspective. He didn't seem too worried about those penalties. Here, I'll play it. Here's a, you know, here's a, you know, and again, I, I do want to tell people once again, free agency begins in 10 minutes. Uh, we are going to hear here for Brad Stevens talking about, I, this might be what you're talking about. We're going to try to do the best to put our best foot forward to do that. Um, the, the required part of that is the right, talent to build around it and um, we're very fortunate to have a lot of talented players um, you know obviously you know um, Chris Stapps is sitting up here Jason and Jalen have been mentioned a ton we've talked about Al and Rob we haven't even mentioned Derek and Malcolm right like and Peyton we've got guys that are under contract here that are really really good players um, and so building a team around that that all fits together in our best way we can is what what our what we're trying to do um, and so it's about winning. So again, they can do what needs to be done. We'll see, uh, you know, whether they do it. We do want to tell you as uh, we await here at the start of free agency. Uh, podcast is brought to you as always by our exclusive wagering partner here, CLNS Media FanDuel. Uh, go to FanDuel.com/slash/Boston. That's the wrong one. We we're not two hundred in bonus bets again, are we, Amit? Believe we are. We back are. To it. Yeah. That's where we're back to. Oh, my bad. This, this is the deal, back to 200 in bonus bets. So you sign up, you do get that deal, which is actually pretty cool. Um, before it was a no-sweat first bet, we're back to 200 in bonus bets. So you sign up immediately. You make one bet, $5 wager is all you have to do. Deposit 10, bet 5. Win or lose, doesn't matter. As soon as that bet resolves, 200 goes right into your account. So sign up today. Again, lots of fun stuff you can bet on in addition to games, futures, where will this guy end up, what's going to happen here, props, lots of other stuff. Obviously, there's still golf and other sports going on. And, of course, Major League Baseball, which is in full swing, only game in town right now. Uh, but definitely want to kind of set up that FanDuel account, uh, especially as we head into the fall here with football starting up uh, a little bit as well. But in the meantime, there's still plenty of stuff you can get in on that action. 200 in bonus bets when you sign up today, FanDuel.com slash Boston again uh free agency beginning at 6 p.m eastern time as you said it's not a sterling class really I think the biggest moves feel like they're going to happen with trades and the big bombshell that kind of dropped very recently was Harden um is unhappy who 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 could have saw that coming uh more reporting on this today yesterday it was that he's picking up his option to uh facilitate a trade 
uh, that he and the 76ers are going to work together on it. Today, there was reports that he was starting to get unhappy with how things were handled, how the Sixers were handling his extension, some of the stuff that was being put out there, a vibe that like, sure, test free agency and then come back to us sort of thing, not necessarily felt wanted. And so he said, I'm out. I'm out. See you later. Trade me. So he picked up his option and that's where he's going to go. Um Clippers have been mentioned. Obviously, the Clippers are still looking for a guard. They want. They thought they had one in Malcolm Brogdon. Um, I, I, two things. One, let's see where he ends up and what happens. Uh, the return cannot be great because he cannot be extended. So you're getting Harden on one year, and then you just got to hope he likes it there and resigns. Uh, he signed that two-year deal in Philly. I'm kind of surprised he left. I don't know what it is this guy's looking for in life. Uh, like, this doesn't seem like a bad situation. I, I don't know why he would want to leave it, but he does. So here we are again. Same. I mean, same story. He's yeah. a couple of years and I, I don't like it here anymore. Yeah. A seem, year. I don't know. Doesn't seem capable of finding his own blame in, in his situation, which stems from a lack of interest in free agency. The Rockets always looked like an outlet for him to escape to if he didn't get the money he liked in Philly and they balked. Two, it seems, at offering him the big money here that he wanted two hundred million. Inconceivable, I think, given what he's done the last couple of years to offer him that through age thirty-seven season. Uh, so, uh, w- what you're looking at here, if you're the Celtics, is will Philadelphia completely disband in this deal? I'm looking at some of the potential returns here, even if they get a Terrence Man and uh, Norman Powell or whatever it's going to be salary wise here. You're not in a position to compete if you're Joel Embiid and this team. So you could wait a year and try to restructure and go into free agency next summer without a look at next summer's class. I can't imagine there's a ton there. But I always thought when I first heard this, maybe you're flipping them to break up that George Kawhi duo. And if you're moving forward with George and Embiid, I think that's something to work with, but it doesn't seem like that's in play here. So yeah, it's not really I don't think, completely disband as a contender here. If I, Embiid asks out after this, it's possible. I don't fully get it. And then a report earlier today, they're not going to extend Maxi. I don't think that's because they don't like him. I think they're just, they want to remain flexible there um, with that. But, you know, I don't, I, you know, I like the idea of Maxi being able to run the show over there in Philly. Uh, but, you know, you've got to get some sort of return for Harden. I'm not sure what that's going to be, given the fact that he's a grump. I would have liked the Maxi George, and Bede thing. That would have been interesting to me. Yeah, I don't think it's a bad one. But I don't know what's going to – I don't know what's coming over. So, you know, every team just wants the star, and they don't want to have to give anything up in return. So I don't really know what's going to happen here. But, again, I'm not sure what Philly gets here for a guy who has demanded a trade, has only a year left, is getting older – um, you know, in con- more inconsistent performer than he's been, hasn't been in terrific shape, um, you know, and uh, doesn't play defense. So I have at it, I guess. I don't know. You know, at this point in time, like, I just, I don't know, who, you know, you can argue, we argued about this with the Harden for Jalen sort of stuff. And I, I, I never really wanted to do it, even though he's a far, in his prime peak, Harden is a, far superior player to, 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 to Jalen Brown. Um, but I just, I felt like that slide is going to come fast and hard with this guy and just this stuff of him, just getting, just hating it everywhere he goes. I just don't want to be any, the, the older he gets, the further he gets from prime hard and the less I want to be associated with this guy. So if you're trading for him, you're trading for past performance and you're doing it to appease a couple of stars that just want to get, more stars on their team and really don't know what it takes to build a championship roster. They just want the names. And I know there's a lot of people that find themselves in that situation. I have to make my stars happy. So I have to go get this guy, even though I don't necessarily want this guy. Yeah. I'd hold out on this. I'd, I'd wait just like Maury did with Ben Simmons. I criticized Maury at the time for waiting and looking like he deteriorated Simmons value until he, Quired Harden, and looking back at that deal, even with how poorly it's gone the postseason for them, losing in two straight second rounds, they won that trade going away, and they still have this Harden asset to work with, and I think you stretch that out if you're Philadelphia, regardless of the drama that comes with it, because if you're just training them for Clippers' salaries, you're effectively done. You're in a bad spot trying to build around Embiid, and you can use that salary in other spots, and you can use your picks here. 
Uh, maybe whatever's coming back and postponing this maxi extension allows you to stay in play for Lillard, who I think is the next shoe to drop this summer. I'd be stunned if Portland doesn't pivot in the near future and try to trade Lillard. So is this the first step toward that? Just get Harden out of here, stack up those salaries, and be able to make the most aggressive offer to Portland for Lillard and hope that he'll want to play alongside Embiid. That would make a little bit more sense to me a couple steps later, but it's going to be hard to comprehend them shipping out Harden and playing ball with the Clippers here just to take on some salaries and have no plan around Embiid next year. Um, but they must know something, right? Uh, I don't know. I always wonder um, what they Because it doesn't make sense. Like, are they just going to play out next year with Maxi and Embiid and whatever they get back from the Clippers here? I, I honestly don't know. I honestly don't know. I'm very curious um, what happens there. Um, you know, we have, uh, we're one minute away here from free agency. So I am, you know, we're going to be, we might be a tad distracted as we're checking the Twitter machine to see what's coming across here as we can react to it in real time. Um, the only other news we'll throw out there right before the clock strikes six, uh, big news in Celtics nation. Um, Derek white is bald. <laughs> there it is. Did everyone bully him into shaving his head? Stephen a did. Yeah. It started in our chat long before that. I feel the, our I mean, honestly, I, he might have one of the more ridiculous hairlines I've ever seen. It begins closer to the back of his head than the front of it. So, yeah, it was probably time. Um, we'll get used to it, I guess. I love it. I think it looks great. Yeah, definitely has uh, more of a dad look now, and I know he's embracing that uh, side of his life now. Yeah, so. I, I don't even think it's close. Yeah, and 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 he's closer to Sherrod now. You know, Sherrod Sherrod's a big fan. Uh, Amit Amit reminds me. Unsurprising, yeah. Yeah, so uh, so that's all good. And you know, he might have done it to appease Sherrod after uh, Sherrod lost Marcus. Um, so that would be nice. It is six o'clock, so NBA free agency is officially underway. Ding 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 ding. Uh, we just hit a thousand here um, of you guys kind of hanging out with us here on free agency. So let's friggin' go. Hey guys. Only real stuff in the chat. Now that I said that, what's going to happen? <laughs> the biggest lies ever. Um, but let's see. Let's see what happens. Yeah, going to be interesting. Uh, who is the one star who slips away? I think Fred Van Fleet's the guy with that real chance. I yeah. I don't know what Toronto's doing. My Raptors continue to baffle everybody by trying to run this thing back here. Gary Trent's back. Siakam's back. OG. Scotty. It was a terrible year from them. I remember their reporters were down here in Boston. When I was hyping up their playing chances, and they were like, you're not going to see the Golden Raptors State, in the playing. Golden State, Draymond, back. I'm bummed about that one. I want to see him go to the Kings so and challenge I. the Warriors four, from down four, the road. Four and 100, I would have liked to see him go to the Kings. I also wanted, um, you know, for the to see if the Draymond experiment could possibly work out of Golden State because I contend that it cannot. Um, so, uh, you know, yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's something else I was looking for. That's the first, that's the first Shams report that we have right now. And that's one of somebody re-signing their own free agent. So before anyone has a chance to swoop in here, Draymond Green gets four and a hundred and he is returning to uh, Golden State. So that's the first deal to drop. Yep. Uh, the second apron coming in a little higher too, it looks like from the NBA. So a little bit more wiggle room for the yeah. Celtics underneath that a little bit. Yeah. As you mentioned, the uh, Joe Harris went to the Pistons two future seconds. Is that what it was? Yeah. I think they swapped seconds, but the Nets probably sent more valuable ones yeah. uh, to Detroit. I don't know exactly which ones went in each direction, but effectively they paid two seconds to get off 19 yeah. million. So the question is, anybody worried about the tampering situation by coming here and announcing a deal at 601? Looks like it. Yeah. Unless you're signing your own guys, there's not as much of a worry no, there. <laughs> you, can, you can do that. Yeah, so I'm sure we'll see those kind of signings first here. I, if I remember right, I think it moved a little slow last year too, right out of the gate. I mean, we're used to just everything, like an avalanche falling on our heads in terms of the signings here. Yep. Uh, no, it doesn't seem like it's going to go that way this time around, especially for guys heading elsewhere. But it doesn't look like too many guys are going elsewhere. I go down this list, and 
even some of the more intriguing mid-level guys, not exactly like mid-level exception, but like the medium sized stars in this class, Jeremy Grant guy. I love Syracuse guy, probably heading back to Portland. Um, you're looking at Cam Johnson, who I think has a massive implication from a Grant perspective because some team's going to look at Cam Johnson in my mind before Grant and tie up their cap space in offering him a uh, offer sheet before they move on to Grant. That originally looked like it'd be Detroit given their massive amount of cap space, but they ate up 19 million of that with bringing on Joe Harris today. So they're not in that picture anymore. Um, I had them about like 29 below the cap. So eat up 19 of that. They can't really make an aggressive offer on Johnson. So I wonder who that team's going to be. That team can't be the Grant team then. So that takes another team out of play. That can't be the Grant team. Um, And I do think Cam Johnson deserves to be ahead of uh, Grant Williams in that line. Uh, But yeah, I am curious, uh, you know, what ends up happening with that. Bruce Uh, Brown, the next name I think of. Maybe the most intriguing name in this class. It might be, sadly. And I want you listen, cowards, NBA teams. Let's go. Make your, you know, make your trades. Remember, okay? I sat here one make year your, uh, ago. Make your signings. Don't worry about the commission. I sat here one year ago and said, Bruce Brown is that guy the Celtics should pursue. I love Bruce Brown. I think we all, I think we were all on the Bruce Brown bandwagon. Yeah. Um, and I was surprised how cheap he was. So I, I, I would have loved Bruce Brown. I, I, you know, I think he's terrific. That would be a signing that I think would have Celtics fans doing backflips if it happens. It's yep. hard for me to imagine them being able to do that at $5 million. Even I, You can't do a sign-in trade if you're the Celtics. Your team's too expensive, so you can't add them in that scenario. So I don't see it. It's interesting, though, because the Nuggets can't pay them a lot either. They only have early bird rights on them. So 9 to $11 million per year, it's a little bit of a bump. I know sometimes teams will line up those salary years so they can get to his full bird rights and like have kind of a wink wink to pay him later. And he's a great fit next to Jokic. He really is. Yep. So maybe he says that's more valuable than anything, me being able to play off this guy and I'll take my money later. Uh, but I'm sure he, the reporting is that he's going to take a bunch of meetings here, Dallas and New York and these other places. The Lakers seem involved. And these aren't cap space teams. I find it interesting, too, that Dallas has been connected to Grant, John, right? You've heard that a little bit. Mm -hmm. They're not a cap space team, so you'd be taking something back as Boston, even if, well, no, you'd be taking real salary back. And and I've kicked around Maxi Kleber uh, for $11 over a couple of years there. I think that probably makes the most sense if you're Boston as a depth center. He'd be your new Muscala in many ways as kind of that depth reserve for who can play a little bit. Uh, alongside a center. I think that'd make some sense if you're looking for a cheaper Grant replacement. Not quite the defender Grant is, but a great shooter. Uh, So let's see. What do we got? Anything coming through? No, cowards. You're (laughs) all chickens. Tarian Prince heading to the Lakers. What? Tampering. That's got to be mid-level money, I'd imagine. $5 I think, is what they're working with there. So... Tarion Prince on a mid-level makes that's sense to me. That's the best we've got right now. Karis Levert heading back to Cleveland as well on a two-year $32 million deal, a little above the mid-level. Uh, what do him. we have the mid-level of? We've got now Kuzma returning to the Wizards. As you said, more, people are going are going to stay back home. Four-year, $102 million. So you're paying 25 to Kuz and 30 to Poole. And uh, Kobe White back to Chicago, three years, thirty-three million. Kuzma's intriguing. That's definitely a guy who's going to impact Grant. Uh, he could have eaten up Pacers cap space. Could have eaten up one of those bad teams yep, yep. cap space. So him going back to Washington leaves cap space open in other places. That is true. Um, so yes, um, there are some ones uh, rolling through, but as you know, we did say. Some guys re-signing with their current teams. Obviously, that can be reported because that's uh, that's that's allowed. Um, so uh, we'll see what happens here. Anything else? The Colby deal is three years, thirty-three million with the Bulls. So yeah, we've got some movement. We've got some movement. Uh, what 
let me ask you this. Um, as we wait on more uh, deals, what if you had to make a surprise pick? Um, is there a move that's going to be like, what uh, that happens here in free agency? Because again, the names aren't really there. Yeah, I'm looking at those low key guys. No I one got... is reporting Bruce to Indiana. It's not out there yet. People in the chat are saying, but it's not out there yet. Guys who could swing teams on the margins, I think, are so intriguing to me. And I think a lot of these names are going underneath the radar. Not Bruce Brown. I think people are talking about him a ton, especially after what he did in the finals. But that was a guy who did that last year, who went to a place for $6 million, five, six million, and really swung things for a great team. It feels like these guys sneak through the cracks, and I'd throw Grant in that category as well. You know, a sneaky guy in this class, not someone you'd call a headliner, but someone who's good enough in his role to really swing a team's depth, make them better in those shooting and defense areas. Uh, I, another guy I'd throw out there in that regard, who I think is getting brutally forgotten here in this class, is Seth Curry. Well, I, some people are like, that. he's like the jewel of this class. I don't know necessarily about that, but uh, he's an interesting name that could be changing teams that, you know, I mean, a couple of years ago, and he's on the older side now, which stunned yeah. me because it took him a long time to get up to the league. I think he started in Golden State system in 13-14, but he shoots so well. He can create. Not a great defender, of course. Injured a little bit last year, but underutilized in Brooklyn in a massive way after he came over in that Harden deal. He was critical to everything Philadelphia did when he played there. He was constantly part of their actions and uh, an off-ball shooter who spaced the floor for Embiid. One of the best shooters in the league a couple of years ago. Maybe the best percentage-wise, I want to say, that last year in Philadelphia. If he's playing off a star player taking o- open threes, it's going to be money. And he's shorter. Yes, he's a defensive liability. So how great is he in the playoffs at this point? It's up for debate. But last year, in a down year, he shoots 40% from three for the Nets. A couple years before that, 45% yeah. on five a game. He's lethal as a shooter. And when shooting's the name of the game now, you want that guy taking your threes. And I, we said this with the Celtics, John. If you're going to take a million threes, which I don't think either of us like, at least have <coughs> the guys out there. Who exactly. Them at a high know, rate. You, you, need, you, need a few, you need a couple 40% shooters. And again, what's funny is like Celtics actually had them this year in Brogdon and uh, – and, uh, and you're and talking Horford. about getting rid of Brogdon and losing Grant potentially <laughs> here. Your, your shooting's taking a hit. The, the Celtics secondary is- shooters actually, Bobby, what's funny is Celtics secondary shooters and the guys taking those threes <coughs> from Derek White to Brogdon and Horford, who were both elite this year, and even Grant when he was in there were fine. Celtics got killed because their two best players who shoot the most threes were, were below average. That's a fair point, yeah. Uh, so it really wasn't the uh, personnel. It's that the stars were shooting uh, uh, low. And again, because they're shooting more contested ones, late in the clock ones, you know, and things like that. So you expect the percentages to be lower. But uh, the majority of them are coming from, I mean, Tatum's averaging 10 a game and he only shot 34%. So I think that's what really killed you, um, you know, uh, percentage-wise as a team. The rest of the guys who were shooting them, with the exception of Smart, were, were, were hitting them. So I don't yeah. mind it. But I don't mind it as a philosophy. But you're right. You would like knockdown shooters. Yeah, especially if you're getting one on a bargain, if you are going to use your mid-level. And I think it's tricky to use your mid-level because you do actually get hard (laughs) capped at 182. And where you're so close to that number, I think you're about seven short. If you're signing a guy at $5 million, you're bringing in one more minimum guy and you're signing Jordan Walsh and you're done. You you don't have much flexibility at that point. The Kobe White is 3 and 40. Yeah, he doesn't intrigue me a ton. Bowles not. <laughs> he doesn't. I I am all, I'm looking at all, I'm looking at money being thrown around relative just to Grant. Yeah, that's all. Just to so, Grant's value. So forty for threes. 13. It's, it's thirteen point three three. You know whatever. Yeah, that's that's mid level money, <laughs> give or take. Wait, what did we say the mid levels at this year? Twelve point four for the 12.4. full one. Got it. Teams like the Celtics that are over the luxury tax can use five. Five point nine or whatever, right? For the Celtics or something, five five. I think it's just five flat. So yeah. uh, 
you're not flat. you're not offering much if you're a tax team like the Celtics. That full one, of course, hard caps you. There's yeah. only I think about ten to fifteen teams that can use that, yeah. and many of them have cap space anyway. So I think that's what Grant's gonna land, give or take. You know, I used to be the twenty guy. Not after the year he had. I held firm. I said, I, I said the deal he turned down is the deal he should have taken. A- anything past twelve, I think, was too much. That's kind of where I had him at. I, I've always said it. He's mid-level money, but on a, on a longer-term deal. Um, you're, he's not going year by year, but that's about who he is to me. And again, the, what was the contact contract I always pointed to was the um, oh come on, Memphis, uh, Clark. Clark, Brandon Clark. That was the deal. And that was four and fifty two and at thirteen million a year. That's that was it. That's 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 there. <laughs> that that that's it. That's what you are. I don't understand thinking it was more. I, I, I never really understood it. I don't know how we talked ourselves how people talked themselves into it. I Grant Williams can do a lot of great things, but again, you know, you, you you pay up a little bit for, for, for guys who can fill it up a little bit more. Uh, other than that, he's a role player and a good one. But, I you know, these deals, these 3 and 40 and things like that, that's kind of the range, I think, for players of that of that caliber. I think that's a, I think that's as far as you go. DeAndre Jordan, back to the Nuggets. My God, he's back to the Nuggets. I, you couldn't have told me. I If I guessed, I wouldn't have known he played at the, for the Nuggets this year. <laughs> He was out there. I think he actually played a little bit in the finals. Yeah. Tiny bit. My goodness. It's amazing. Back to the finals that they used Jokic at the level they did. The minutes, the usage, everything else. Without much of a backup. There wasn't really a guy there staving him much. Uh, we used to look at those minutes where he'd be off the floor. They'd be getting killed and he'd be out of breath at the end of games and this year he was shooting through, or when he was off the floor, they were, you know, they were, they were winning those minutes pretty substantially. So that's still the team to beat next year, especially if they get Bruce Brown back. Uh, it's going to be a, a tough team to handle once again, even with some of the other contenders out there in the West looking pretty good. Um, no other deals as of yet. Um, we haven't talked about it, so we'll 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 kick this around a little bit while we go there. Um. How do you view right now the uh, the uh, Damon Lillard market? Oh man! And, I, we have, and we've yet we've yet to discuss um, uh, Kyrie, which we might. But uh, what about the Lillard market? So I'm adamant that the Nets make tons of sense for him. And you know how it always goes for me in this situation is where I am with Harden. Why is Philly going to trade Harden to the Clippers who have nothing to offer and don't make any sense other than the player wants to go there? It seems like Lloyd wants to go to Miami. We've been kicking around this hero Robinson I hate it. thing. It's, a, it's, it's an offer it. no one wants. I it's, hate it's it. A, no one wants it's it. It's terrible. <laughs> I think the only people who keep floating this are Heat people who want it to become reality. When it's that's the thing, it, it's almost like Celtics people <laughs> when, when trying to make every trade without Brown or Tatum. You know, in the past, it's like, well, if you do smart and this and this and that and a couple of picks, maybe. And like, no, nobody wants that. You know, like nobody wants that. Not for a player of that magnitude. You got to get something back. You know, and then like none of that is enticing. They're not, there's nothing there that puts Portland back on the map. You know, you, it, it does not work. Lillard is, look at what the return for guys of his stature get, you know, and I know his contract is big, but he's one of those guys who are like, I don't give a crap how much money he makes. He earns every friggin' penny of it. He's a, now. He's a capital S star. And these deals, these next few Supermaxes are going to make his look like a bargain in a couple of years. I know he's going to be old in the last year of his deal, but like, look at what Harden went for a couple of years ago. Like, you got to bring that price up. The, the Heat aren't even coming close there. Yeah, so rule them out. I think the, that's the biggest reason the Blazers are standing firm on keeping him right now is that Miami would be the only serious suitor. 
I don't know what the Nets' perspective is because the Nets are the best, clearly the best option here. Yeah, and I wonder if they do want to go all in here because I'm sure Portland would command all of those future Suns picks. Maybe they meet in the middle somewhere in a couple of them. But really, the only valuable ones out of them anyway are the future ones that are beyond those Durant years and the Beal years ahead here. Because obviously the early ones in the near future through at least 2025 or so are going to be bad end of the first round picks. Uh, So that's a tough one for them. Does Portland want Ben Simmons? I'd take a flyer on him, at least as the matching salary here from Portland, and I'm starting over. Woj just reported it now. Uh, ESPN reporting with Mal- uh, with Mal- Malika. Is it really, is that who, did Malika report this? Maybe. Yeah, she did. Um, free agent Bruce Brown. What do you think the Bruce Brown money is? It's a two-year deal. What do you think he got? More than the mid-level, I'd imagine. So 15, 16? Two years, 45 million with the Pacers. Oh, okay. So they did the two-year short-term big money over 20. Yep. Okay. That's something I've kicked around with Brown, um, Grant. If they do something more short-term with him to have him in those early years of contending here and then get off him you know, once the Brown and Tatum deals kick in. Two years, 45 million with the Pacers. So Bruce Brown, have yourself a day. Good for Bruce. Uh, he got paid. Um you know, big, big money for him. Uh, went to Denver on the cheap last year, won himself a ring, proved himself to be an invaluable player on the team. A lot of people were begging to get him back to Boston. Nope, not at that money. <laughs> like there's no, I mean, Boston no. can't really sign any free agents, but certainly. You could, uh, you could do this deal with Grant though. Yeah. I, I mean, no, but still. Short so, term. Get off him before Brown and Tatum are out and guarantee you keep him around? Yeah. I wouldn't hate it. Yeah. This is an interesting fit. He's a, with a great passer, a few great passers in Turner and Hal Burton. Should be able to show off some of his secondary ball handling here. He's a good defender for this team that needs some defense. They struggled badly on that end last year. But this is a great team. And this is a team that I think is going to sneak up on some people this year because Hal Burton got hurt last year. He's played sparingly at the end of the season, and they decided to tank, which was probably the smart move. But they picked a few good players. Jairus Walker, I think, is going to be really good at the four for them. Young guys like Neesmith, I think, are going to continue to grow there around Halliburton, who should have been in the MVP race to some degree last year if he played out a full season. I don't think anyone forgets, Sean. I mean, I don't think anyone remembers. when Hall- The day Halliburton went down, I think it was in January, this team was the sixth seed in the East, pretty firmly. So they're coming. Halliburton's amazing. He's probably my favorite young player in this league. I Brown, will not. I, I don't want to hear any of this from you, okay? Because you because you know what I wanted to do two years ago, and you said that's ridiculous for Halliburton. Well, you ended up being right there. <laughs> I love that guy, and I think he would have been great. But, yeah, uh, that's, again, a lot of money for a role player there. We talk about the grant market. That's for two make, years, though? I understand it, but, like, two years means you're deep into that second apron on that second year no matter what. And, like, that's an untradeable – that's a hard – I mean, that's a salary matching contract in a trade. But, like, you know, I, I don't know. I, I guess on two years because the next year you can just give the salary away. And, mm-hmm. you know, as a, as a, as a matching contract a year later, yeah, I, it wouldn't be stunning. I don't, it just seems like a lot of money. Yeah, it is. It, he was a bargain as old contract and he benefited greatly from playing next uh, to stars in his last two spots, Kevin Durant and Brooklyn, Jokic and uh, Denver. Yeah. So but like this, this is, I mean, this is uh, what you were guessing is what I would have been guessing, you know, like, on a per, on, you know, on an annual deal like a four and sixty, exactly. <laughs> I mean, my God, Brown is going to be like, oh my goodness, thank Who's, you. Uh, who is Bruce Brown's agent? Because he has done a spectacular job, a phenomenal job. Yeah, Ty Sullivan, congrats to you. Yeah, now Grant Grant's price just went from twelve to thirty-two million because of that deal. Nice job, Jeremy Grant. Did you see that? Back to Portland. Back to Portland, five year, one sixty. Yes, that's a great come up for him. He worked hard, 
think drafted by Philadelphia, had that nice stint in Denver, Oklahoma City as well along the way. He's just bounced around everywhere. I actually caught up with him last year, as you know, I like to do with my Syracuse guys, and you could just tell it's it's been in like he's rolling his eyes at how many different teams he's been on at this point, and he gets a major commitment here. Maybe he's still somewhere else over the course of this deal, but. Uh, for now, he's he's staying in Portland, making big, big money. Good for him. Yep, yep. I've always loved him. Remember, we used to kick him around in Detroit as a guy to play next to Tatum and Brown. No, Would great as that. that third guy. You know, like when you thought you might be able to get him, and you know, it, he was that name that kept kind of coming up there. Um, you know, as as a guy, you know, and then you know, signed the deal with Detroit. Um, Speaking yeah. of, while well, we wait for some more deals to come in here. Uh, I did run into Marcus Smart today. Saw him for the first time since the deal. Didn't talk to him for long. He was running his in a children's camp today, but in good spirits, clearly a little shaken by the deal, still shocked by it. In a surreal place, especially having some, you know, Celtics employees come through. Twist was there today saying goodbye to him. And I guess this is gonna be his goodbye weekend here. Uh Memphis will introduce him next week after he gets done with some charity events here this weekend. But, you know, in good spirits, but man, you, you can tell it's definitely still a shocker that Marcus Smart isn't, isn't part of this team totally. uh, going into the future. And we'll hear from him next week officially, but uh, definitely was interesting to cross paths with him today. And I think we'll catch up with him more on the record over the weekend at his event. So stay tuned for that. Did uh, did he talk uh, on camera at all today, Bobby? No, but I think I'm gonna get him tomorrow at his uh, at his. So tournament. what did he uh, when you were talking? Like, what was that? Did he say like, yeah, surprised or anything like that? Yeah, everyone was stunned. Everyone uh, in his in his camp was was completely shot. I don't think anyone saw this coming um, in terms of him being dealt. So they're all a little shaken. There's no doubt about it. And I don't think there's any animosity or anything like that. I think they all understand this happens and it was going to happen someday. But uh, there's shock not only with him, but also everybody in that organization who clearly loved him. Um, They made a tough decision and they made it pretty quietly here. I don't think anyone saw that coming. But we do have some Celtics news here. What do you got? Kristaps Porzingis and the Celtics have agreed on a two-year extension. Not what I want to see. Why? Part of part of why I didn't love this deal to begin with is the one year deal for Porzingis that's forcing you into yes, a bargain below the Wait, why did you million. not want to see this? Injury prone. Who reported not this the by the fit. way? I guess Haynes. Chris Haynes. Yeah, okay. So, I didn't yeah. want to see them extend them, John, for a number of reasons. The injury well, history, look, the fit, <sighs> and you get the best out of a guy during his contract year. Now, I understand he he could go out in free agency next summer and force you to pay substantially more than this. But I, I, look, you I, got one great year of him on the record. So here's the thing. He needed it most. When the trade first came through – Um. Our vibe was they traded one year, two years of Brogdon for one year of Porzingis. That's how that's how we analyzed it, right? Yeah. And and so we were just thinking, okay, this was straight. Like, let's see what we can get out of this guy. If we choose to resign him or we want to, we'll have the inside track being able to do that the following year. But they were, it looked like they were clearing books to um, to. Uh, you know, to, to get under that apron and under the tax, you know, when the new CBA kicks in and then it was getting reported that they wanted to extend him. And it became very clear that like, no, this is a piece that they want. They like this guy. They want this guy. Uh, and then, you know, that first report, I think it was Stein. He's the only one who had it. Mark Stein Celtics fully like are go- not just planning. They're going to extend him once they get an opportunity. When Brad's been asked about it, Bobby, he's, he's been like, yeah, I can't talk about it, but it's it's happening pretty much. Um, here it is, bang, and this is exactly what it kind of kind of had been reported. 
that uh, Porzingis, you know, was going to get this two-year extension. He did. If they love the guy and they brought him in here, I think it's silly not to extend him. I know there's risk involved, but like, I, I, you don't have a guy come in here, 27 years old, in the physical prime of his, you know, career, coming off of a career year, have an opportunity to try to lock him up for a little bit longer, create security, and not do it. Can it go wrong? Sure, because there's a lot of things with Porzingis that could theoretically go wrong, but. What are you going to do then? Let that salary walk out the door a year later? I think you have to do it. I think you need it. I think it needed to happen. And so, you know, I, that's good. You know, that's that that's good news here uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, Celtics future. I, I, I think it'd be silly not to, honestly. It's yeah, again, but- you can not like the guy. I'm saying this isn't a, I think Chris Saps Porzingis is worth blank comment. It's a, the Celtics believe in Kristaps Porzingis and they want him here. So obviously Brad brought him in here with the intention to, to lock him up. And you saw Brad in the press conference. He was like looking at him with heart eyes, you know, he was giddy about it. Like, I can't believe we got this freaking guy. That's his vibe. And if you're a, you know, in Brad, we trust guy. The belief is Brad's all in on Porzingis. If he continues to play at the level he did last year and shows he compliments Brown and Tatum and doesn't conflict with them as a ball stopper or a guy who's going to continue to demand that high usage, great. You don't get to see it, though, before you lock into this extension here. And this is still my question here is how this interacts with a Brown extension. Because you are consolidating your team around three, maybe four guys into the future here, money wise. Uh, so this goes through 26. So we'll start that year that Tatum's extension will begin. It's it's not an incredibly long term deal, so there's limited risk in that sense. Yeah, and you do what? get a year off from the big big money with Brown and Tatum here, and one year off from Tatum's big big money. So I I get the way you're lining up the money here so that it comes off the books in different time spans. Uh, But you don't get to see how he fits first. You don't get to see how healthy he'll be over the course of this deal. And yes, it's a good number. 30, I think is manageable as the cap continues to go up here, but it's still a third player at 30 million. It's it's an expensive team. It's a team that I think is going to get, thinner as the years go on maybe you didn't have a great alternative john this might have been the best thing that they could do here to shake things up i don't hate the player but remember and i thought about this yesterday when kemba was on the trading block and we were kicking around the names these contracts the teams just wanted to get out from awful deals contract for contract we were kicking around horford of course he was one of them porzingis was right up there too John Wall, I remember. I mean, this guy was looked at as one of the worst contracts in the league at that time. And it was, of course, a much bigger deal at that time as a percentage of the cap than 30 is going to be here. Right. But it's still a guy who carries those same risks that he did back then. One year, to me, doesn't change that. I get the risk. I get the fascination, particularly in their system, how this guy could fit seamlessly. But it's risky. You got to admit, John, there's, there's some risk here. And I know you got to accept some risk, but I, I, I just wish, and I get why you couldn't, but I wish they could have had him play out a contract year. Yeah, I, I, you know, again, I, I, I don't think it makes a lot of sense, but I, I understand where you're coming from here. I'm just nervous on a number of levels about this deal. Something my 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 gut doesn't love it for a number of different reasons. Again, it's the player, not the deal. If it was player X of Porzingis caliber, who was a different guy that you liked a little better, I think you would like the extension. Again, I'm not arguing the matter. Not liking the extension is not liking Porzingis necessarily. And I get that. I I think there's some people that are a little dubious still about like, which guy are we getting? You know, like, are we sure we're getting the really good version from last year? So uh, again, I think not liking the extension is just simply not being sure. Do we have the cut? Do we have the cut from yesterday about him uh, talking about fitting in with the Jays? 
We may. I'll take a peek and see what we have in there. I, I and I think so. Um, and I'll I'll pull it up and play it. But I, I, again, like how, I said, how, is, how did that how did that strike you? So I I asked him. How, he's played with stars before, but it heads a little bit, or at least played at a high usage next to those guys with the ball in his hands a ton. I, honestly, my feeling was it was a pretty boilerplate answer. Um, uh, you know. Said he just, wants to make life easier for these guys and fine. that's his goal here. Boilerplate. Um it, it was I've you know, well, you know, it was the same with Brad and Coos last year, you know, but he's like, those guys are great. But you know, I think it's a guy who has confidence in his own ability. And I don't think he's in here thinking he's a third wheel, a third fiddle guy. I think he's in here thinking I'm Chris Tapps Porzingis and I can do what I can do and I'm gonna do it. Um I, I, I think it's a fair question to say. You know, it's always interesting. You'll always look at the first, you know, the not the first, you know, big three 2.0 with Garnett, KG and Pierce as the ultimate experiment of three guys of very close to equal stature. Right. Um, In different ways impacted the games. Ray Allen, every single one of them had been the alpha on every team they'd ever been on. Right. I I like where you're going with this because. Who are you stacking up second in this hierarchy right Right. now? But what I'm saying is those guys didn't have a 1, 1A, 1B, 1, 2, and 3. They didn't. So they decided to collectively, we're all going to take a little less. And look at their stats. It's unbelievable. Every one of them went from 21 shots a game, 20 shots down to 16, down to 15. They changed everything, their commitment to defense. Ray Allen changed his style, playing more off ball than he ever had in his life, running around screens, catch and shoot, didn't have the ball in his hands as much as he used to. This guy's scoring 28 points a game at one point, you know, and just became, you know, so they, they did what was needed, but it was very clear that there was an, there was, it was equal across, you know, it's pretty clear here that Tatum is one and Brown is one B. Borzingis is coming directly from a place here where he wasn't the, the number one guy. So I think he understands where he is in this. I don't think he's coming in thinking, I'm the man, you know, give me the ball. It's not he, even about being the man, though. It's about how have you played through your career and sure. can you adjust? But I mean, again, he's played, he's a guy who does what he does with the ball in his hands. And as a guy who I think he's a capable passer, he's not, you know, he's not going to light it up necessarily, but it just becomes a question of like, now that you've got for the first time, I don't say first time ever, but the Jays development has been interesting because obviously in the early years you had other guys, you know, who had, you know, the ball in their hands more and those guys played second fiddle. And then you kind of had that one crossover year, that final Kemba year where you had Jalen, Jason and Kemba. And you felt like Kemba kind of was like, I'm taking a backseat to these guys a little bit sort of thing here, you know, but like, really only the last two years where they've been the automatic, you know, you know, one and one a guys. And this is the first time they've had another guy who's even in the conversation with them among like who could be, you know, a scorer and do it on his own and, and, and also kind of an alpha sort of guy. So I am curious whether each one takes, you know, each one sacrifices a little uh, of, their own personal scoring or their accolades in order to make it work. There's no duo in the NBA that accounted for more, a higher percentage of their team's shots than the Jays last year. Okay. They, they really probably even last year should have taken fewer shots. (laughs) They really should have, they should have worked to facilitate a little bit more. I think they've got to do it even a little more. I've always said this, Bobby, like, and I'm curious your thoughts on how Porzingis fits. I think it's less about how Porzingis fits. I think it's whether those guys finally, adopt a mentality of I'm better if I do a little less, you know, all of these guys need to. And we've said that with all the of them. Jalen's going to be at his best when he's averaging 16 and 17 shots a game instead of 20, 21. When they're looking to do more with the ball than just score, they'll be better for the team and the team will be better for it. Yes. And they all need to embrace that. And Tatum, of course, will sacrifice the least out of all of those guys is, uh, I guess in your comparison, Pierce probably did at that time. Uh, he probably has continued to shoot the most, but also took a it step was back. Cl- in some Bobby, ways look at the stats. Making. It was so close. Garnett probably sacrificed the most, but like Allen was like a multi level scorer, not just a three point shooter. So that's shooter. the key. The third Ray guy Allen always was sacrifices guy, the, lead, the most. 
not only did he sacrifice the most, Ray Allen, when the, in other place, yeah, you're right. Somebody's going to sacrifice the most. When when they came here, they started doing post game press conferences with the big three every single game. And as time went on, Allen's like, nah. And it just became KG and Pierce. He actually started to feel a little bit of a third wheel, but he did it anyway. And that 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 existed almost from the get go. Allen was a guy who could score from all levels. People forget Ray Allen was in a dunk contest at one point in his life too. In addition to being a three point king, so like he was a really dynamic scorer three level scorer so all of these guys gave up a lot to get there i think it's kind of time you you wonder whether the celtics can and will do that too because brown brown's done he did it he can retire from chucking shots right he's gonna get his super max deal at this point he doesn't need it anymore like he kind of had to prove himself both of these guys are getting paid whatever they want massive massive deals the stats don't really matter anymore no, they shouldn't, particularly after you lose in the East Finals and dead yeah. dang fashion. And, and, and you got to start turning that corner of your career where the wins matter the most, you know? Yeah. And you should feel the weight of these losses more, too, and how hard it is to win. Joe talked about that yesterday, and I thought it was the best stuff he said is that we got to find a new identity, a new driving principle for our group. It was easy to say coming off a of finals loss, oh, avenge the finals but then you lose the next year and it's like what's your motivation now who's really all about winning with this group Porzingis actually sounded pretty sincere in his desire to come here compliment and win next to these guys Uh, so the third option if it's him I, I think that's always the most difficult spot to be in you mentioned this tough spot Ray Allen landed in he did it he won but then he left uh so you're looking at Kevin Love in Cleveland did it won Still ended up in this weird place in his career. Obviously, LeBron left after, but the next couple of years, it, it was a weird transition for Love into that role. I thought Chris Bosh did a tremendous job with it. Maybe the best of any of the guys we can mention here. I would agree there, yep. Uh, so maybe he's able to pull a Bosh and completely but Bosch transition. also clearly was a little – I mean, you're talking about Wade who'd won a championship on his own already and LeBron. I mean, there's no question he was coming in – clearly but is, wade, is that where porzingis comes in here though wade had home he's coming in more as a bosh yeah exactly it's a it's a it's a good comparison yeah especially the position too i think it's easier to play that complimentary role is big so it you know my analysis stays the same here defensively he he's going to be transformative that's where i love this deal is that you get that real post presence, particularly in a drop where he's excelled and where he's played and the kind of defense that Joe wants this group to play in with multiple bigs, with maybe a sprinkle of three bigs sometimes. How's triple big sound to you, John? <laughs> I don't know if we'll actually see that, but Brad mentioning it was funny. It's probably just to piss you off. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I I think he shot me a look there. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, it's they're it's, playing big though. They're going to be playing big big lineups with these guys yeah, in the Jays, yeah, and, and so. it's exciting. And defensively, the possibilities are endless yeah. uh, on that end. And I think he'll be back to being that forceful top team in the league. Yeah, he's got to develop some chemistry with these guys. He's got to be locked in on that end. And that's where offense becomes my question because, of course, for a lot of these guys, yeah. how you're performing and how you're fitting in on offense can dictate that defensive intensity so where does he fit in on offense joe talked about it a little bit yesterday um trailing plays well, and shooting three i want to get to joe in a second too uh, hold on i let me sneak this in real quick and we'll get back to you because we do want to tell you quickly about athletic greens uh, or ag1 daily foundational nutritional supplement supports whole body health uh, each and every one of us at the Garden Report drink this literally every single day since we signed on uh, with Athletic Greens. Uh, Jimmy Toscano might be the biggest proponent of it all. He never goes anywhere without it. And you don't have to either because when you sign up here, athleticgreens.com slash garden, you get uh, five free travel packs. So you can take it with you, a lifetime supply of uh, of uh, vitamin lifetime supply. I say it all the time. <laughs> one year supply. Uh, That's a tall D. promise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, so why do I do it? Like I said, total body health. Great. Sign me up. Uh, covers all nutritional bases every every day. Better gut health. 
uh, boost energy, immune system support. Uh, you don't want to go out there and take a million different pills and vitamins. And that's kind of what uh, AG1 allows you to do. So uh, it's great. Tastes great. Boom. One scoop of water. You know, one, one scoop, cup of water, you're done. I squeeze a little lemon in mine, uh, give it a little extra flavor, but I dig it. So again, athleticgreens.com slash garden. Sign up today. Take advantage of this special offer and also take advantage of this uh, free T-shirt we will send you as well. Also, merch coming to CLNS Media uh, as well. You can sign up and get all of this stuff on our website at our new uh, merch store. So uh, look for that in the coming days as well. Uh, back to here. We did talk to Joe. He gave a very Joe answer about, you know, how do you use Chris Daps? And one of the questions was, he's really good in the post. What are you planning on doing? And Joe goes, get him the ball in the post. Um, but then he kind of kept going on and, uh, you know, answered the question in full. But like your thoughts on Joe and how how he kind of views this, you know, situation here. I, I think it's a player he'd love to use given the three point shooting and spacing. They can balance. Obviously, Joe preferred playing small. It sounds like Brad prefers playing bigger given their success with that lineup two years ago. Uh, so, this is the best of both worlds. Uh, you can play bigger while maintaining spacing. I, everyone disagrees with me, but I keep saying it's probably going to be Horford and Porzingis starting. I think Rob comes off the bench like he did last year. You limit his minutes. And you get spacing on the floor from both bigs in tandem with each other. Whereas with Rob on the floor, Rob's only rolling, right, John? That's the only thing he can do offensively. So he's going to be in the middle of the floor. And Porzingis is in the corner in those combinations. So, yes, you get your best defensive duo with those two. But it continues that awkward dynamic offensively I keep talking about here. Rob's really going to take the biggest hit from this addition, isn't he? Well, I think yes and no. Because let's let's not be ridiculous. Like Al Horford played way too many minutes last year. Like, so you gotta figure this out. I think Porzingis is gonna play some standalone five. I do think they will go double big because they're going to have to. Um, but I do understand the merits of you know uh, of Rob coming off the bench if you are starting Al. Uh, and you might have to in this regard because again what else are you going to do here? Who else you could possibly put into that position? Um, I don't see any other combination necessarily that works there. So I think you kind of have to go there. Uh, you do need some second unit juice right now because you're going right. to have Brogdon in there and you're going to have Rob, who's really outside of, as you said, a lob threat or a guy just kind of hanging out there, uh, really not able to do a ton. That's, um, what, I, that's what I'm – It is It is a weird bummer to take Rob out out of that first unit because of the gravity with that lob threat and what he does for, um, for, uh, for uh, Tatum uh, and Brown and opening up a little bit of space for those guys. So I, I, I wouldn't be stunned to see it go in the other direction, but you know, uh, you know, here's the other thing you've, you've solved a little bit of a shooting problem, not starting Marcus smart anymore. If Derek white is close to the shooter, he was last year. Cause if you're bringing Porzingis in there, you've got to, and you do start, Al, you've got a pretty good shooting lineup on that floor um, at all spots, and that is an interesting way to kind of start things. So uh, it makes sense, but the reason it doesn't make sense is rotationally, when you start Al, it feels like you're going to end up playing him more and playing him more minutes, and you're right. It's going to take a huge bite out of Rob. Rob, to me, is always a, such a big wild card, right? Like every year you just want to hear that he's spent all summer working on shit, you know, and then you want to see him come in and it's been a bummer. Two years ago, he came in thicker and it said it was like he was working out to, you know, bang with the guys and he did and he was fat and it took him a while. And the surgery. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it's it took him been... a while. It took him a while. And, and we, we, cr I criticized him like Rob's lift isn't there. And everyone's like, shut up, John. And it wasn't. And then he got it back and he was dominant. Um, and then you're like, wow, that would be great if he could come back. But then he lost a whole off season because of that stupid surgery that he had late when he probably didn't check in. Nobody knew what he was doing. And when he did check in, he's like, my knee hurts, by the way. And they're like, what? And he had surgery. <laughs> so like, again, I get the vibe that they're like, man, just do the stuff professional athletes do. And like, come on. Uh, you so have like, to think if, is if this they... the year Rob does it? Oh, uh, it, wouldn't it be something? It's hard to imagine. What? Going Kyrie? to the bench. 
Back to the Mavs. It's hard to imagine going to the bench. And Hold on, breaking playing. news. Kyrie Irving, three-year, $126 million returns to the Dallas Mavericks. They got out of a fourth year, which, I don't know, maybe Kyrie wanted that too. I don't know. But that's probably good for Dallas that they retain him. And I, I, they had to at this point, but, oh, boy. Could have been four one sixty. Yeah. Forty Four, a year though. Forty two million. Yep. Forty two million. Let me ask you another question before we wrap here. Um, you know the big news on the Celtics front. Look, it's free agency. We opened it up. We wanted to talk to you guys. We're actually thrilled how many of you guys made it out here on a Friday afternoon, Friday early evening. Um, so it's nice hanging out with you guys. Um, we all we will continue to bring you news if there's breaking news involving the Celtics, any big, big, big news. Um, one shoe that had the drop for the offseason, we did not expect signings. So the free agency show was because there'd be a lot of news in the NBA, but we hardly believe that the Celtics are going to get involved here. They really can't. Uh, but there's still business to be done. One of those things was the Chris Stapps Porzingis deal, and they did it. They extended him. Um, the other order of business uh, it appears to be the you know is the Jalen Brown extension. When can they do that? Uh, I think in a couple of days, July sixth or seventh. Okay. So that's the next thing to happen, and it's been you know discussed that he's going to get the bag. Uh, other than that, it's potential trade sort of stuff. What happens if we get to you know I don't you know necessarily want to deal in hypotheticals. What happens if you get to that day and he hasn't done it yet? think they're gonna do it i mean (laughs) again it'd be inconceivable for him to pass that up and all the indications are the celtics are gonna offer it so i think it it gets done and i don't i i still haven't looked at the numbers john but i don't think there's a real benefit to giving him the haircut it's bigger than 295 now right because the cap went up maybe by no the cap didn't go up i think it's still at 136 for next year um so it's still Five and two ninety five is still his number. Yeah, so you're talking about fifty in that first year. Got it. I I think it gets done and they figure it out from here. But you are juggling, as I said earlier, thirty for Porzingis, fifty for Brown, and then fifty four for Brown in that year where Tatum starts around fifty four ish. So it's it's going to get expensive. It's going to be harder to fill depth around these guys. They're definitely taking the short view with this, which I don't mind. Uh, but Middleton staying with Milwaukee also. And again, as you said, everybody's staying put um, I, three, three years, one Oh two. I see uh, another name floating around with the Celtics here too. Um, someone put out there Delano Banton from my Raptors, uh, who's kind of been a guy floating around the edge of their roster for a couple of years here. He's 23, went to high school in mass, it's a bit of a slasher, a little bit of a ball handler, not much of a shooter. I think he's below 30% from three. But he's got good size at that wing position. I think he's 6'9". Uh, I think I want to get the guy's name here. Raphael Barlow is, is saying that the Celtics are connected to him. I don't know how reliable this guy is, but it's a name that's floating around there. It's probably a name in their price range if they're going to go the mid-range route. If they are looking at a mid-range guy potentially here, I think that says something about Grant uh, and what his outlook's going to be here. I do want to say, too, with the with the – TPE thing we've kicked around. It it matters that you can't kick that back a year, and that's been a big part of the Celtics strategy. John, going back to Hayward, is using these TPEs to kick back money to the next year. Because when you usually get a TP, you say they got a TP today, you have it until July first or June thirtieth, whatever date you want to use here, to use that money. Fournier, too, another guy they got a TP on. You can't do that anymore with the new TP. That money expires at the end of the same season. So the Celtics do have to decide here if they're going to go into that second apron um, this year. You know, they can't kick it back to next year if they're going to use that grant money. And I think you need to. I think you need to keep it on the books, whether you're trading grant, whether you're keeping them, or whether you're using that TP at some point this year. You got to do it this year. There's no kicking it back. So I think you are going to be a second apron team this year, which means no mid-level, right, John? Second, Cam Johnson, 
four years. Guess the money. Okay, he's staying with Brooklyn four years and one hundred. Close one hundred eight. Way above, you know, mid level money. And again, he got the Grant deal. He got no the Cam deal. <laughs> The deal I thought Grant would be getting after two years ago. Yeah. He was the guy at the beginning of the year when I said it, and we were theorizing what he would get and what he, what, what, you know, and you know what he was worth. And I said, he was worth way more than I thought what Grant was. Um, and you thought Grant was worth more. Um, he had a great year. And, and again, a- put those couple of games too when he put up, you know, those massive numbers. I think just kind of shows you like ceiling for sure. It blows um, my mind. I, there's certain guys you look at. Obviously, the draft just went by. You see what they are in college, and you say, yeah, they did some good stuff in college. And Grant was a little like this too. He had a game in college. You looked at and said, oh, that was great in college. Why is he going to adapt? And these guys completely changed their games. Cam Johnson at UNC was a totally different guy what we're seeing now and he's adapted his game perfectly to play alongside nba stars with the three-point shot and defense and everything else a great get for brooklyn i love what they're doing i think they're going in a great direction fast fast right way faster than you would have thought and i think a lot of it has to do with the fact that i mean that haul you got was i mean again not much for Kyrie, uh in 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 there in terms of players a distant first that's not bad but you got a good return on durant um, because a again, great I, return. you know, and Bridges, you got a legit star back. Bridges, Bridges is like free. I mean, already fringe of all NBA. He's like a 35, four, you know, he's like a top 34, you know, he's, he's definitely like on the doorstep sort of guy, you know? So not all NBA, but like all-star caliber player, right, right. Like right out of the, you know, right out of the gate. Uh, so they're doing well for themselves. Uh, Brooklyn, you know, I, I thought they'd just be in total darkness uh, after that. And it doesn't look that way. And, it, you know, they got rid of a bunch of stuff they had to get rid of, and they're probably pretty happy about it. Yeah. Phil, uh, Philadelphia losing another guy, obviously Harden out the door. George Niang, Niang yeah. as yeah. well. A great player, great shooter. Yeah, not a great player, but yes. A great role player, I, I'd say. Great shooter, good ball move. I don't think Philly played him enough, actually, yeah. looking back on that series. Um, but that's a good addition for Cleveland, a team that needs shooting and wing depth badly. That's yeah. that's mid-level money, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Hold on so, one second. Um, so, yeah, we are going to wrap it, I think, um, ish, because more stuff could happen here, but – um we do you know we're, we'll wrap it up if any if anything crazy happens we might jump back on here but i think we are gonna we're gonna get moving here good football talk coming on uh, uh on the patriots channel if you want to jump over with our our beat reporter taylor kyles uh and uh cleveland's and not done by the way we're we on max Struess. oh they got him the, well they're working on a sign and trade scenario with them uh, along with bringing back Levert and adding George's name for sure. There you go. Uh, Kyrie Thompson and, uh, and 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 Taylor Kyle's doing some Pats talk. You guys want to jump over to the Pats channel. That's coming up right at 7 o'clock um, just as we sign off here. So if you just want to hear some football talk, off-season football talk, jump over uh, to that show uh, as well. Do you think, uh, uh, you think we're going to see Grant tomorrow morning at his camp? Uh, you think there'll be any news on him by then? We got to hope so, right? I don't know. I wonder, you know, what didn't happen? Grant hasn't happened. We talked about orders of business. So we'll see what ends up happening there. As of now, all is quiet on the Grant Williams front. Um, I guess that'll be the last. That's the third order of business, you'd say, right? It's what do you do with Brent, with Grant? The Chris Dapps thing and the Jalen thing. That's kind of what we've been talking about this entire, um, you know, off season so far. So we'll see what happens with Grant there. But Yeah. Nothing yet. Nothing yet. We'll see what teams sign which players and who's got money left and what ends up happening with that. But right now, nothing. Uh, Bobby, final thoughts? You know, I don't love the Porzingis extension. I, ju- I just don't. There's, there's something about it that worries me. And, and maybe it's just a gut thing. Maybe it's just how I've always looked at him as a player. 
we'll see how it pans out. But that's obviously the biggest Celtics news of the day is that he's going to be here long term. Not going to get a contract year out of him. I get it from a money perspective, John. You would have been paying over a hundred million next off season over how many years if he has a great year. But you also get to see what you have here in him. So I get it. You had to do it. You almost got forced into it. You're, you're right, John. You said earlier, if you liked him, you had to keep him. If you didn't, then you don't even go and get him. Uh, so I get it, but it makes me nervous. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah. Anyway, we'll. Uh, the chat it, loves them. The chat. Yeah, I, they, I hear, their yeah. smart tears are wiped away, and they love Porzingis now. It didn't take long. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna wrap it. Later, guys. They love them. We'll see you guys later. Thank you guys for hanging out. We'll uh, we'll jump back on if there's other breaking news. Uh, follow Bobby for all the free agent updates and everything else. Also on CLNSmedia.com. Uh, this has been the Garden Report.